Uh, good morning. Uh, thank you all for coming. <clears throat> I'm Michael Green. I'm Senior Vice President uh, for Asia and the Japan Chair at CSIS. <clears throat> and uh, this is our third uh, annual um, Asia forecasting event. We um, started this uh, a few years ago to um, force ourselves to think about um, what we should be anticipating or worried about or hopeful about in the coming year. <clears throat> and then we designed it in a way where the audience could participate um, and give us some uh, empirical data using the clickers that you see uh, on your seats. Um, we'll test those in just a minute um, to see if they work and we'll ask you to leave them on your seats when you exit so that we can use them again. They're useless at home. Um, <laughs> Uh, sort of like when I try to use my remote clicker on my kids, it will not do anything. Um, we um, are um, live on uh, www.csis.org, and you can follow us on Twitter at CSIS, hashmark CSIS Live. Sounds like a comedy show. Um, we uh, 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 are um, organizing this event with our own internal funds based on general contributions we get. <clears throat> um, and uh, I've also been asked to let you know, in case you didn't, that once again this year, CSIS was voted, voted the number one profit, excuse me, the number one uh, top defense and national security think tank in the world by the University of Pennsylvania's annual think tank report, and the number one nonprofit podcast for iTunes, for all of you following us on iTunes. <clears throat> um, that's not music, that's actually us talking. Um, <laughs> people, actually, we, we, have, we have been on the iTunes top list with Miley Cyrus at one point, so I don't know if that's uh, a technical mistake, but apparently we've, we've made the charts. <clears throat> um, uh, we're going to go through two panels. Um, this first panel, which will be chaired by uh, Mira Rapp Hooper, um, our uh, fellow for Asian security and the director of our Asia Maritime Transparency Initiative will focus on political and security developments, and in particular, the alignments or potential shifting alignments that are happening uh, in Asia, and whether they might continue or solidify over the coming year. Um, and then the second panel, which will be moderated by Scott Miller, um, will look at um, economic uh, reform within countries. Uh, like Japan, uh, China, India, and others that are struggling with some pretty difficult challenges in their political economy. Uh, we'll ask you questions on the clickers throughout. The way we do this is we'll ask you to make a prediction, we'll show it up on the screen, and then we'll ask one or two of the experts on the panel um, to, uh, to comment and, uh, and see how they'd analyze that. But first, to test the clickers, um, uh, and also, uh, to see um, how we've done in past predictions, we want to ask you three questions um, that we asked last year. So in order to validate our predictions, we are not going to review anything that anyone on the panel said last year, but we're going to review what you all said in the audience um, and see how good you were. Um, this is the professor in me. Um, you get the grades. Um, so um, if, uh, uh, if we're ready for the first question, um, uh, we're going to ask you to answer it, and then we're going to show you what people said last year. Um, so where is Will? Okay, we good? All right. So the first question we'd like to ask you, use your clickers. This is also a test to see if the clickers work. Is the United States living up to the expectations of the so-called rebalance to Asia announced by the administration? The, they, are, they, they are living up to it in real time. It goes up and down. Um, see, now you will have an opportunity, for those of you who like C, you will have an opportunity to click C on, on later questions. But for this one, it's just A and B. Um, okay, so um, it's about 67% say no, not living up to the expectations of the rebalance. 28% uh, say yes. Can we show, Will, what the audience answered last year? Oh, that's it, on the left, sorry. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, the administration uh, gets points for improvement, to be sure. And I wonder if a lot of that has to do with um, momentum on TPP um, and uh, what was a pretty successful trip by the president to India and then to um, Asia in November. All right, the second question that we asked last year was how concerned are you about the potential for military conflict in the region. 
this year. So you, now you can do A, B, C, or D. And Will, don't show last year until I give you the cue. <laughs> right, so um, we were voted the number one think tank for security and foreign affairs, so we tend to attract pessimistic audiences. Um, but discounting for that, uh, 62, 63% are somewhat concerned, 7% are extremely concerned, um, those are the people on their Blackberries right now, <clears throat> and 16% uh, uh, neither, and not concerned at all is only 12%, so that's interesting. Uh, okay, well, how, how pessimistic or optimistic are we compared to last year? So maybe a slight, and of course we can't control for the audience, which may be different, <clears throat> um, a, a slight decrease in terms of um, uh, extreme concern, but still considerable concern about security problems in the region. Um, and the third question, so far you're doing great with the clickers, except for that A-B question. <laughs> um, which of the following best describes your expectations for regional economic growth this year? So for the year 2015. Uh, Interesting, so limited growth, um, this is a cautiously optimistic group, 71 or uh, percent. All right, last year, how did, how did we look at things, Will? That's interesting, so less uh, of an expectation for, uh, for significant growth. Now we're gonna do the low-tech version, and this will completely undermine the methodology uh, of this approach. How many of you were actually here last year? <laughs> All right, so. Uh, um, okay, let me turn to the first panel. Um, uh, as I said, Mira Rapp Hooper is going to moderate. I'll be on the panel, <clears throat> joined by Victor Cha, Senior Advisor and Korea Chair here, um, Bonnie Glazer, Senior Advisor for Asia, uh, Freeman Chair, um, uh, and Chris Johnson, our uh, Senior Advisor and Freeman Chair in China Studies. So over to you, Mira. The title of our panel this morning is, Is Asia Rebalancing Itself? Here in Washington, we are very fond of scrutinizing and debating various aspects of the U.S. pivot or rebalance to Asia. Um, and in fact, earlier this month, we held a terrific event here at CSIS and put out a report from our Asia team called Pivot 2.0, uh, which focused on how the new uh, Congress and administration can cooperate together to advance the U.S. pivot to Asia. Uh, but in Asia itself, we're seeing some interesting new dynamics emerge. Uh, some of these dynamics have a lot of history behind them. Some of them are truly novel. But the purpose of this panel today is to tease out some of these emerging dynamics uh, and talk about what we really expect to see from them in 2015. We've got a great panel here today, and I know that you're all warmed up uh, and ready to use your clickers. So let's jump right into our first question. What is in store for U.S.-China relations in 2015? Should we expect to see increased tension, a continuing mix of competition and cooperation, movement towards a new model of great power relations, increased cooperation and confidence building measures, or none of the above? It looks like our audience thinks we will largely see a continuing mix of competition and cooperation. B is looking very strong here. Um, but let's loop our experts into this discussion. Chris, uh, what, what is your projection for U.S.-China relations in 2015, and what are the drivers behind whatever you think that trajectory might be? Uh, sure, thank you, Mira. Um, I, I think the audience response uh, reflects kind of where we are in the relationship uh, at this moment. Obviously, we had a good summit meeting between the two presidents uh, on the margins of APEC in Beijing in the fall, um, but not a clear sense, I'd say, so far this year of exactly how we're going to translate that into uh, deepening the relationship. I think there's a, an active discussion going on in Beijing uh, with regard to how to deal with President Obama during the remaining two years of his uh, administration, how much to engage, how much to focus on other priorities. And my sense is that they really haven't come to a conclusion, but, uh, but certainly uh, there's a heavy emphasis on keeping the relationship stable, keeping it uh, correct, but it's not clear to me yet that uh, they see value per se in, in trying to invest deeply. Uh, they certainly have a sense that the president is struggling 
domestically. Um, but there's also a sense that 2016 is very uncertain uh, for them, and uh, they're not sure how it's going to come out. I think there's maybe a general sense in China that um, whoever it is might adopt a, a bit tougher policy uh, toward China. So my sense is we'll continue to see this sort of mix and of, of uh, collaboration and competition going forward until we sort out which direction we're going to go. And I think it may take till the next presidential election to do so. Terrific, thank you. Bonnie, um, can you add, add some more uh, color to this picture as well? What perhaps do you see uh, for the U.S.-China military relationship in 2015 and how has this changed, if at all, since last year? Well, the U.S. military uh, relationship with China uh, has been making some progress and will continue to do so in 2015. Uh, in spite of a uh, Wall Street Journal report yesterday that military exchanges are on hold, uh, that is not true. Uh, there are some very Im important uh, exchanges that are on uh, the agenda. In fact, the defense policy consultative talks will be next week. We will have uh, a visiting uh, vice chairman of the Central Military Commission. Uh, there will be more exercises, uh, and importantly, uh, there are ongoing negotiations on a, an agreement on air-to-air -air encounters uh, to avoid accidents. Uh, and both sides uh, have committed to conclude uh, this agreement by the end of 2015. I think that uh, Xi Jinping remains very invested in this bilateral military relationship and uh, hopes to see that the uh, agreements on avoiding miscalculations uh, will be completed. Uh, so I'm quite hopeful uh, that they will be. And then uh, I'll, uh, these agreements, in fact, will, will really be templates for the negotiations between China and Japan on some similar issues, and we'll probably be talking about that a little later. Terrific, thanks. If, if you had to identify one potentially confounding black swan, something that could knock this mix of uh, competition and cooperation in one direction or the other, what might that be and why? Well, I think that my, my answer to that would flow from what I was just talking about, and that would be an accident. Uh, I think that really what keeps people up at night who think about the U.S.-China relationship are not the ongoing problems and you know, cybersecurity or China's land reclamation activities in the South China Sea, uh, but is an, it, I believe it is uh, an, an accident that would take place at sea uh, or in the air. Uh, the political uh, ramifications of an accident uh, and the difficulties of the two sides managing respective publics, particularly on the Chinese side, potential then for protests and the spillover that that would have in, uh, in other areas. Terrific. Chris, Black Swans? Uh, I, I actually think for me it's more the commercial relationship that's uh, the, the thing that's at the most risk perhaps this year. Um, we just had a letter from several of the um, associations around the Chamber of Commerce uh, to the new uh, cybersecurity and informationization leading group yesterday with regard to these new policies that have been being put out um, by the Chinese government with regard to uh, banking restrictions, what kind of IT gear can be used um, in banks and in other sensitive institutions in China. Um, so it's another suggestion that it's getting scratchy. Obviously, there's a high interest in uh, moving the BIT forward, as came through uh, both with, at the visit the President had and prior earlier in the uh, strategic and economic dialogue talks. But obviously, I would think it seems to me our trade bureaucracy is much more focused on TPP right now, for good reason. Um, and so my sense is that this is the space to watch. I, you know, I agree with Bonnie wholeheartedly that an accident is very dangerous. But I think in terms of the broad discussion on security issues writ large, there's largely a sense that those issues are intractable, <laughs> very difficult, and so are kind of on pause. It's this commercial relationship, which traditionally is what keeps us from tipping over into a more adversarial relationship that could be problematic, especially with China's economy slowing. Terrific, thanks. Let's stay in Northeast Asia as we turn to our second audience poll question today. What is the most likely outcome for Japan ROK relations in 2015? Will we see A, an improvement of relations with an Abe Park summit, B, muddling along and some occasional trilateral cooperation via the United States, C, deterioration over history and territory issues, or D, none of the above? 
As many in our audience might know, there was some sidelines talk between Ave and Park uh, that uh, over APEC uh, that there may be some bilateral senior working groups coming up. And Japan and South Korea has have recently pledged to share military intelligence on the North Korean nuclear program. But of course, we still continue to see uh, issues over history and the comfort women issue. Uh, our audience seems to think that we will see B muddling along with some occasional trilateral coordination with the United States. Let's turn to Mike. Mike, where do you see Japan ROK relations headed this year? And are there any especially important events on the horizon in Japan that may shape these factors one way or the other? Whenever Victor Cha or I are, answered, are asked to answer this kind of question, we inevitably anger someone in Seoul or, or someone in Tokyo. So I, Victor's not going to get out of this one, <laughs> but in starting, I will endeavor to anger everyone <clears throat> um, uh, to be balanced. Um, it, it makes no structural sense in terms of international relations and the distribution of power that, that uh, Korea and Japan are at such odds right now, <clears throat> given the fact that they're both U.S. allies, they're both democracies, <clears throat> and there are enormous um, uncertainties about North Korea and about how China will use its growing part power. There are some economic explanations at a structural level for the tensions um, in that Japan is uh, relatively less important to Korea. Um, Korea trades more with China now than it does with the U.S. and Japan combined, <clears throat> but that does not capture how important um, uh, Japanese uh, technology and components are to the Korean economy, and it doesn't capture the um, enormous level of, of foreign direct investment between uh, particularly the U.S. And, and Korea, which should lock this triangular relationship. So it's largely um, historical memory, uh, uh, domestic politics, and identity, uh, rather than um, the structural issues that, um, that many people um, use to understand these kinds of alignments or <clears throat> dealignments. I think the audience probably has it about right. <clears throat> I would be, um, I'd give a little more weight to A, uh, some improvement with an Abe Park Summit, and maybe a little less to C, deterioration. <clears throat> I think both governments um, recognize how damaging this is to their larger strategic interests in relations with the U.S. and in terms of how Beijing views it uh, and North Korea. So I would lean a little more to A, but I think uh, some combination of A and B is most likely. Some, uh, I think there, on balance, probably will be a summit this year. I'm not sure it will be uh, uh, transformational um, in the relationship. Um, the key sticking point for Seoul in, is the issue of the so-called the comfort women, um, and uh, whether or not Japan will stick to uh, the um, uh, apologies and statements made um, by Chief Cabinet Secretary Kono and Prime Minister Moriyama in the mid-90s. <clears throat> I think odds are very, very strong that Japan will stick to those statements. Um, and uh, th that's the official position of the government, and I think that will be um, uh, true, and I think that that um, discipline is spreading within the ruling LDP. People recognize that they have to keep that. Um, I also think there's, um, on the 70th anniversary, um, uh, uh, a good likelihood we'll see more statements like the one Prime Minister Abe made to the um, parliament in Canberra, which I call to people's attention. It was a very um, moving statement of what um, Japan did in the Kokoda Trail and in other battles with Australia, <clears throat> very well received by not only the Australian government but the Australian public. Um, and that's the kind of model I think the Prime Minister's office will work on. I've heard some people in the administration say this is a Nixon goes to China moment. You know, Abe should do as a conservative what Nixon did to China. It's not going to happen. And I think it's, um, uh, uh, I think it's uh, a false hope to expect it. <clears throat> um, uh, on the Korean side, which Victor can speak to, um, I think that there's perhaps um, uh, uh, an unrealistic expectation that the entire Japanese political system will have message discipline, that even if there is a summit, um, there's no guarantee that someone somewhere will say something that's offensive to Koreans. <clears throat> um, that's also uh, you know, not likely um, uh, to be uh, candid. So in 1998, the high point, the high watermark of Japan-Korea relations, um, uh, President Kim Dae-jung and Prime Minister Obuchi met Prime Minister Obuchi apologized and expressed remorse for the past, and Kim Dae-jung welcomed Japan playing a larger role. That, that, that was 1998. <clears throat> what people forget is that 24 hours before they met, uh, a drunken member of the Japanese cabinet went on national TV and said, the Koreans owe us for everything we did. We shouldn't be apologizing, and just sort of did a, an ad lib that was incredibly 
uh, uh, destructive, and Kim Dae-jung chose to ignore it and focus on uh, what the Prime Minister said. Um, and um, similarly, um, in the past, uh, Prime Ministers have um, said uh, things uh, about relations with Korea when members of their own government have, have, have gotten out of line, as, as Obuchi did. So I think a lot of this will depend on how much the two leaders want to uh, make this work. It's not going to be a breakthrough. It's not going to be A, but some uh, but B with some heavy flavoring of A is, is possible this year. The three countries, Japan, Korea, and China, are working towards a summit trilaterally. That will start to pave the way. Um, so I think you can be a little more hopeful than your response, but not probably a whole lot. Victor, what are your thoughts on this relationship, potentially confounding factors or events, and how will the anniversary of World War II matter in Korea? Um, thanks, Vera. Um, so I think, um, first of all, all of you who said C are probably wrong because it couldn't get any worse <laughs> than it is right now. Um, um, let me make a couple of points to complement what Mike has said. I, the, the first thing I think we have to remember about this relationship, oh, by the way, I think I'm going to go out on the limb and I'm going to say A. I don't think, it, I think it's going to be A. I think there's just, with this being the 50th anniversary of normalization, there's just too much pressure on both sides to meet. And uh, as, as Mike said, it may not be a transformational meeting. Maybe they'll be shaking hands and staring at each other's shoes, um, as we saw in another uh, summit meeting recently. Uh, but uh, but I, think, I think they will have to meet. A um, couple of points. The first I would say is that um, <clears throat> this relationship is, ex we have to remember, it's an extremely complex relationship, right? This is not just about comfort women or Yasukuni Shrine. I mean, there's so many elements um, um, and so many variables that contribute to how the relationship um, proceeds, whether it proceeds uh, filled with historical tension or whether it proceeds through periods of normalcy, <clears throat> having to do with domestic politics, having to do with identity politics, having to do with bargaining leverage. So it's a very complex relationship, and I don't think simply uh, you know, a statement on comfort women or, uh, or something like that is going to solve it. I just don't think that's going to happen. Um, the second thing, though, is that while we are in a very difficult period in the relationship today, I would um, urge you all to remember that overall it's been a good relationship. It hasn't been a perfect relationship, but in the 50 years since normalization, to me it's actually quite astounding how these countries have been able to work together in spite of some very deep historical issues uh, that pull them apart. Um, so we are in a bad period now, right? But um, I think we have to remember that overall it's been a fairly cooperative relationship. Um, the, um, <clears throat> uh, having said that, I think there are, sort of, there are two sort of major obstacles um, uh, to an improvement in the relationship, aside from you know the politics of meetings uh, and the ceremonial things that we'll see in June at the 50th anniversary or at the 70th anniversary of the end of the war, and both of these obstacles are not material, right? They're ideational obstacles. The primary obstacle on the South Korean side, um, quite frankly, and and Mike's right, I'm going to piss off both sides. Right? The, the the problem on the South Korean side or, or the Korean side is uh, they're in a mindset now where they feel like Japan is not important. They feel like they don't need Japan. They need the United States for the immediate term and the long term, and they need China for the immediate term and the long term. But there is a mindset now in Korea that they don't feel like they need Japan, and I think that's terribly mistaken. I think it's hugely mistaken for economic reasons, for longer term strategic reasons, uh, for alliance reasons, um, it's, it's, a, it's a big mistake. And the big obstacle on the, on the Japan side is um, also ideational, and that is there has been a dramatic, sh I shouldn't say dramatic, but there has been a definitive shift in opinion and views on Korea. Um, in the past, when there, were, uh, there was friction between Japan and Korea, it was usually the Koreans were emotional and angry um, on the one hand about history, about other sorts of issues. And on the Japanese side, that was um, uh, uh, responded with largely indifference and in some cases ignorance. Right? And I think, but at the same time, there was, uh, there was sort of a, a sense of some generosity, give some slack. Uh, to the ROK because they are our neighbors, they are 
our quasi-allies, these sorts of things. And I think one of the biggest shifts today is that that has shifted. Japanese opinion has shifted in a direction that is um, quite negative on Korea. Um, and, uh, and that, I think, is going to, that, that's a challenge. I think these are the two challenges. On the one hand, Koreans think they don't need Japan, and on the other hand, Japan's opinion has shifted a great deal on Korea. Um, and, uh, you know, a summit meeting is not going to be transformational. It's not going to change that. Uh, even a statement on comfort women is not going to change that. Um, uh, and, but I think these are sort of the two, the two big obstacles right now. Terrific. Thanks so much. Let's stick with Japan, but pull China back into the conversation as we turn to our third clicker question. Will the establishment of hotlines and other confidence building measures between Japan and China later this year reduce the risk of conflict in the East China Sea? A, these will reduce the risk of conflict significantly. B, reduce it somewhat. Or C, no reduction. As many members of our audience may know, uh, Japan and China met just last week uh, in a high-level discussion to establish a hotline, share radio frequencies, and hold regular meetings on the East China Sea issues. But also, uh, just in the last few weeks, we've heard news that Japan has boosted its defense budget a bit, clearly thinking about maritime contingencies, and rumors that China is reinforcing military facilities nearby the Senkaku Islands. It looks like our audience is somewhat optimistic and thinks that the answer is B. CBMs and the hotline will reduce tensions in the East China Sea somewhat. Let's turn to Bonnie Glazer, who's been doing some great work in this area. Bonnie, how hopeful are you that these new measures will actually ease tensions in the East China Sea? Will China and Japan meet their target deadline of implementing these by the summer? And what events might derail these agreements, if anything? Well, uh, great questions, Mira. Uh, I'm sort of torn on this questions be because it seems to me, uh, yes, some progress could be made in actually agreeing on hotlines, for example. Uh, of course, if an accident takes place, then there's the big question about whether the Chinese are going to answer the phone when the Japanese side tries to call. Uh, and I think that the fact that there's not a lot of confidence in that on the Japanese side is a, a, a problem, as in I think that they're realistic since uh, uh, the U.S. has had similar problems. I don't know if they're going to actually get this implemented uh, by the middle of the year. Uh, but as I said earlier, they are using the uh, U.S.-China model. Uh, we have a military maritime consultative agreement that was set up in 1998 uh, to talk about uh, how to avoid incidents at sea, uh, and the Japanese have now created something similar. Uh, they will follow the U.S. in implementing a, uh, an agreement of CBMs to avoid accidents between naval vessels and then move on to the air-to-air -air component. But the broader question here that's interesting, of course, is is this going to actually reduce tensions in the overall China-Japan bilateral relationship? And there, I would say, probably not. I think 2015 is going to be a difficult year for relations between China and Japan. Uh, in part, of course, because of the 70th anniversary of the end of the war, uh, the Chinese are really gearing up to hold lots of commemorative activities. Uh, this is uh, something that I think is in part for domestic uh, reasons in China. Uh, there is a steady uh, uh, be feeding of the Chinese people with television programs, um, education, uh, articles in, in the media uh, about Japan's role uh, in the war, uh, and I certainly expect uh, that uh, to continue. Uh, I was just at a meeting the last couple of days uh, in Singapore where there were just fireworks uh, between some of the Chinese and Japanese uh, participants, and I thought that that was perhaps a barometer of where the relationship is going uh, to be uh, heading this year. So uh, risk of conflict being reduced if the CBMs are negotiated and, and implemented, I would say yes, uh, reduced to some extent, uh, but the overall relationship uh, probably not heading in a positive direction in 2015. Chris, any additional thoughts on uh, the role that these confidence building measures might play and how that factors into the bilateral relationship overall? Um, not, not much to add. I, I would just say that uh, one thing that's particularly interesting about the, the celebratory activities that, uh, that Bonnie just references, they're going to have 
what really is sort of an out of cycle major military parade um, on this issue. Uh, previously, those have only been done at the decennial of the founding of the PRC for the last several rounds. Um, there's certainly a domestic component to that. You know, Xi Jinping will get two of these, I guess, during, <laughs> during his uh, time in office, maybe more. Um, but um, I would say, I wonder, I have no, no firm thought on it, but I do wonder to what degree some of the fireworks Bonnie saw and some of these other things are disappointment, probably particularly on the Japanese side, that after they did manage to get over the line on, on having the two leaders meet, and then it kind of slowed down, and despite the fact that they now appear to be running to make it look like something's going on. And then I guess on the core question, my simple view is just, yes, it will reduce the risk of conflict, but there's still a lot of stuff down there <laughs> in a very small space. That hasn't abated at all, so the, the risk of conflict remains, and I think that's why we have so many people answering C. Mike, let's go to you. What is the role of these bilateral confidence building measures in the overall bilateral relationship, and what events should we be looking out for this year that might affect that one way or the other? I think Bonnie described them well. It's, uh, it's, an, it's a tool, but that doesn't mean that the Chinese side will pick up the phone. I was in the White House uh, when the um, EP3 incident happened. We had a range of confidence building measures and it took President Bush uh, 11 phone calls. He finally found Jiang Zemin in Latin America. So the phones are good. Um, it doesn't mean necessarily the other side will, will pick up. I think the uh, November summit between uh, President Xi and Prime Minister Abe was important though because what it did was it showed both leaders recognized the need to manage this. And it also, on the Chinese side, gave a flashing green light for ministers, governors to start meeting with their Japanese counterparts, um, all of which had been frozen. Um, and that starts to connect um, sign news uh, between Japan and China and helps to you know, reinforce the, the economic interdependence and the other issues of common cause. But that said, I agree with Chris and Bonnie, the 70th anniversary is going to really make this complicated. There's no real change in China's strategy towards these maritime uh, areas in terms of um, gray zone pressure on, on uh, maritime states like Japan. Um, I, I'd be slightly optimistic, though, uh, in one sense. Um, uh, there are other things happening. Um, uh, and one is the completion of the U.S.-Japan Defense Guidelines Review, um, which is going to, I think, uh, reinforce uh, Tokyo's confidence in their ability to handle these things in the position of the U.S., um, and the Japanese side is not surprised by this stuff anymore. So I think there's a kind of a, 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 a discipline to the strategy now um, and, a, and, a, and a confidence um, that will help. The other variable would be Korea. I mean, if, if Beijing tries to make uh, the 70th anniversary a return to Cairo and Potsdam and Japan as the enemy of the world, um, Korea's stance is going to affect how successful Beijing thinks that strategy is. Uh, so going back to our first question about Japan-Korea, um, that's a pretty important variable in this relationship as well. Let's travel to the Korean Peninsula for our fourth audience polling question. How likely is a North Korean nuclear test in 2015? Is it A, very likely, B, somewhat likely, C, somewhat unlikely, D, very unlikely, or E, impossible to tell? As many may know, there were sort of fits and starts preparations for a fourth new North Korean nuclear test in 2014. And just a few weeks ago, the North proposed to the United States a temporary moratorium on testing if Washington reciprocated by suspending its joint military exercises with the ROK. Our audience seems to think a fourth North Korean nuclear test is very likely, followed by somewhat likely. So odds, at least in this room, are looking good. Let's go to Victor, a veteran of North Korean nuclear issues, for his read on this question. Um, unfortunately, Mayor, my eyes are not as good as yours. So if you add A and B together, what does that come to? I can't see it. 78 percent. Oh, that's interesting, because I, I, I remember as... Compared to last year, actually, the number was much higher, I think. It was like well over 90 percent. And, um, and of course, they didn't do a test last year. Um, uh, they did other things, but they didn't do a nuclear test. Um, and uh, they actually haven't done anything like the Chan'an sinking or the shelling of Waipido um, now, you know, since 2010. So it is kind of interesting that we always worry and are justified to be worried about uh, more North Korean provocations. Um, but um, 
uh, we haven't seen them. Uh, we haven't seen the big ones. Uh, it's not to say that they're not developing their programs or doing other sorts of things, but in direct answer to the question about nuclear tests in 2015, um, 2014 we said, I think over 90-something percent said it was going to happen. It didn't happen. And now it's like 70-something percent. I'm still going to go with A. Any though, <laughs> I'm still going with A. So. <laughs> Eventually you'll be right. Thanks, Victor. Let's stay on the Korean Peninsula as we turn to our fifth question. How will ROK-DPRK relations fare in 2015? Will there be a summit between Park and Kim? Will there be increased north-south dialogue and cooperation short of this high-level summit? Will they maintain the status quo, or will the relationship primarily hinge on deterrence because of North Korean nuclear or other activities? It looks like our audience thinks that we are most likely to maintain the status quo in relations on the Korean Peninsula with, I think, that 62% saying that the status quo is the most likely option. Victor? Um, it's an interesting question. I mean, I think what, what, I find, what I've been watching uh, in the new year really has been uh, what looked like very deliberate and systematic efforts by uh, the South Korean government to um, start some sort of uh, engagement with the North. It's not necessarily government to government, but, uh, but uh, some of it is focused on humanitarian needs. So this offer to restart uh, training for uh, North Korean doctors um, and, and medical professionals. And then the other aspect of it is on infrastructure, the, uh, the proposal <coughs> to reconnect at least on the southern side, to start reconnecting uh, the road and railway links uh, between the two Koreas, begin the project on the southern side, uh, and make known to the North Korean side they're interested in doing that. Uh, there was also, uh, it was either at the end of last year or early this year, a pilot project where uh, Russian coal was brought through North Korea and then um, uh, to the port in Najin and then shipped uh, to South Korea. Um, so I think we're going to see more of these efforts by the South Korean government to try to in, engage North Korea. Um, um, in, you know, in other administrations, I would say if we connect the last question and the first question, in other administrations, if there were a nuclear test, I think that would be inversely correlated with the likelihood of a summit. Um, I, I mean, sorry. In the current administration, if there were a nuclear test, I think that would inversely correlate with a summit. In previous administrations, that was not necessarily the case. You could have a, you could have a nuclear test and you could have a summit. Um, but I think in this case, that's, that's probably going to be uh, the case. So I would probably lean more in the direction of B. I think that we'll probably see more North-South dialogue and cooperation. It may not be the high politics stuff. Uh, but I think there's certainly an effort uh, by the South Korean side, and it's connected to their desire to do more of a, um, um, uh, what they call sort of humanitarian engagement with the North, with the North Korean people, trying to probably leverage uh, the, the very small openings we're starting to see in North Korean society, the interest in markets, uh, the interest in information technology. I think it's really trying to, to, to leverage that. So, Victor, just to follow up for a moment, if you're right, and in fact uh, the relationship tends towards B, increased cooperation short of a summit, what sorts of events or metrics should our audience be looking out for this year? Um, so the, the sort of the, the first stop step, I mean the first metric would obviously be family reunions. If there's an interest in family reunions or the two inter-Korean projects, the Kaesong Industrial Complex um, or, the, or the Diamond Mountain Tourism Project, which has been suspended for quite some time. Uh, and then beyond that, I would look for some of these economic projects. If there's, you know, if North Korea accepts sort of the, um, the um, uh, humanitarian aid, such as the training of doctors, uh, vaccination for children, uh, things of that nature. Uh, and then the next step would obviously be some of these bigger economic uh, cooperation projects. I mean, Park Geun-hye has this vision of trying to reconnect uh, South Korea with the continent, right, with the Eurasian continent. And, you know, this is something that cr crosses, spans ideologies. Kim Dae-jung used to talk about it, and, and she does as well. Um, so I would look for those sorts of, uh, sorts of things. Um, I think that... Um, 
it's kind of a balance, it's, it's, it's managing a very careful balance because if there's too much of this sort of cooperation and there's actually no progress at all on the nuclear issue, that's going to create some space between uh, the South Koreans and, and the other members of the six party talk. So I think they have to be very careful in managing uh, any enthusiasm they receive from the North about these proposals. Terrific. Let's bring China back into this conversation as we move to our sixth clicker question. How will the ROK approach its relationship with China in 2015? Will it gravitate towards Beijing and away from the U.S.-Japan alliance? Will it gravitate away from Beijing and towards the U.S. and Japan? Will it maintain the status quo, or do you not know? Looks like our audience has voted a plurality in favor of C, maintaining the status quo, but there is also a significant portion who think that the ROK will gravitate more towards Beijing and away from the U.S.-Japan alliance. Victor, let's get your thoughts on that trend. Um, I, I actually love, this is my favorite question in the whole thing. So um, who, I'm curious, who said, who said B? Yeah, I, I actually tend to agree with the B people. Um, I think actually contrary to um, what might be the conventional wisdom in town that, um, uh, well, first of all, I don't think Korea is gravitating towards China. I mean, yes, they've had six meetings or six summits and, Yes, uh, Xi Jinping and Park Geun-hye seem to get along famously, and yes, they're trying to deepen strategic dialogue, FTA, all these sorts of things. But um, I don't see that as gravitating away from the U.S.-Japan alliance. What I see that as is an effort by the South Koreans to, um, uh, to try to fill a space that they think is opening up between the Chinese and the North Koreans. Um, uh, Chris and Bonnie and others can talk to this, but it's very clear that the, under the Xi, Xi Jinping government, they've got a lot of problems with this regime in North Korea. They are not at all happy with it, uh, the fact that there hasn't been a meeting. Um, and I think the South Koreans recognize that, and that's why they are working so hard at trying to really build equity with the Chinese. And, you know, in the short term, I think it's, it's, it's about economics, you know, it's about all these other things. But in the long term, I think it's really trying to um, uh, shift the way the Chinese weigh their equities on the peninsula, right? I mean, objectively speaking, you know, they're, they're in with the North Koreans, even though it's very costly, both materially and reputationally. Their future by any metric on the Korean peninsula is with South Korea, it's not with North Korea, and yet they're stuck with this albatross around their neck. And I think a lot of this effort by the Park Geun-hye government is really aimed at trying to help, help change the way the Chinese calculate their interest on the peninsula. Now, having said that, every time there's a summit or there's a meeting, I'm sure the Koreans walk away from that meeting feel like, feeling like we're getting them, right? We're getting them, we're pulling them on our side. But I'm sure the Chinese walk away from that same meeting thinking we're pulling them away from the U.S.-Japan alliance. Um, uh, so, you know, which of these in the end is right? I don't know. I mean, uh, there are lots of reasons why I think having to do with geography, history, a whole bunch of things why I think um, staying aligned with the United States and Japan is, uh, is entirely in Korean interests, even if they have a good economic and strategic relationship with China. Um, so for those reasons, that's why I'm actually more in the, in the lines of B. And also, um, I don't think the, Korean, uh, the Chinese will try to make the 70th anniversary about Japan, and I, I don't think the Koreans are going to take the bait because the Chinese have tried this before in their summits with the South Koreans, the bilateral summits, and the Korean response has been very clear, which is basically that, you know, you have your history issues with Japan, we have our history issues with Japan, we deal with them bilaterally, we don't need your help, meaning China, we don't need your help. And, as long as they maintain that line, I think um, um, uh, the, uh, this won't work to anybody's advantage to try to leverage these, um, these celebrations for other purposes. Let's go to Chris. Chris, you're a veteran watcher of the Chinese leadership. What do you think uh, will factor into Xi Jinping's approach to the ROK, and how does the DPRK weigh in all this? 
Well, I think, you know, what we've seen so far out of the Xi Jinping administration, uh, certainly in the early part of 2013, I think there was a lot of discussion about whether or not China had changed its North Korea policy. I, I think if you look at the objective facts, as Victor was just discussing, uh, they haven't fundamentally changed. There's still the lifeline, you know, et cetera. Um, I think what's changed is the way they describe the relationship. Uh, for so many years after the Korean War, it was a special relationship, uh, like lips and teeth and their propaganda, you know, this sort of thing. Um, that's all changed clearly. Uh, there's no instinct from Xi Jinping, I think, at this point to have Kim come for a visit or to make a visit himself uh, to North Korea. And I have to think that, uh, you know, not being a Korea expert, I'll defer to Victor, but uh, in the same way that a Chinese Chinese president has to, a new Chinese president has to demonstrate that he can go to the United States so that he can manage that relationship well. I have to assume in the North Korean system there's some similar desire to go and show you can manage the big relationship uh, with a summit visit. So denying him that is, is significant. Um, with South Korea, yeah, I think Victor's uh, right. There is a very seemingly cozy uh, relationship between Xi and Madame Pak. He's one of the, she's one of the few world leaders where he appears uh, a little um, bashful almost. Uh, it's, it's an odd situation watching them uh, interact with each other. Um, and I think there is some strong personal chemistry there between the two of them. I also think, though, that as Victor was pointing out, if, if China's plan is indeed to somehow try to peel South Korea off of the alliance, you would think then that some of their behavior would be somewhat different. So, for example, with the air defense identification zone in the uh, East China Sea, they had an opportunity to draw it around the, the small area of conflict with Korea. Uh, they were asked to do so, I believe, by the Koreans, and, and didn't. Uh, and likewise, when Xi Jinping went for his summit in Seoul, uh, you know, he uh, was reluctant to, to provide the Korean side with a text of the speech that he gave at Seoul National University in advance, uh, which, in which he bashed Japan and sort of suggested Korea was with them on that. So my sense is that the Chinese may have it in their mind that, that this strategy is working. I, I think Victor's right. Both sides walk away every time thinking, you know, we won. Um, what's interesting to me is what came out of our MacArthur study uh, earlier this year, which is that when asked the question, uh, Korean elites on, you know, 10 years, what's the economic relationship? Huge numbers, China. What's the security relationship? Huge numbers, the U.S. And I think as long as that maintains the balance, then we're probably in a pretty good spot. Bonnie, any additional thoughts on the China side of this? Well, just to quickly link this to a prior question, and that is the possibility of North Korea conducting a nuclear test and then how China responds. Uh, my prediction would be that if the North Koreans do go ahead with the nuclear test or another provocation, the Chinese probably will not live up to Seoul's hopes. Uh, for the amount of pressure that China would put on North Korea. So that could lead to some disappointment on the North Korean side. Uh, so I think that's one thing to watch. Uh, another uh, issue that I think is worth looking at is the discussions that are underway between Seoul and Beijing on the uh, delimitation of their maritime border. And uh, my expectation is that will be difficult. It could lead to more tensions in the relationship, but it's not impossible. Um, and if they did reach an agreement on that, then that could be something that the two uh, nations uh, could uh, use to better the relationship and ease some of the frictions that's been going on between fishermen in their uh, common waters. Great. Let's go to Mike. I'm well, just to wrap this, uh, we spent a lot of time on this, and you could argue this is the most important, uh, uh, together with Japan, Korea, um, variable in the um, overall alignment and distribution of influence and expectations in Asia in the year ahead. Um, and I don't think it is uh, inimical to U.S. interests or even Japanese interests for uh, Korea and China to have good relations. I don't think we're in a world where this is zero sum. But um, I would go with whoever answered E, even though there was nothing up there, <laughs> because the, the right answer, exactly, the right answer may be uh, the ROK gravitates towards the U.S.-Japan alliance, I'm quite optimistic about that, and gravitates towards China. Um, and the reality, the substantive reality in polls and in other ways is that the U.S.-Korea relationship is extremely strong and deep. And even the, um, uh, the expectations of uh, Chinese economic relations are based on trade, not foreign direct investment, capital flows, technology. Um, and so even on the economic side, the U.S.-Korea relationship is very, very deep, plus values, plus security. Um, I worry that in Beijing, um, it, there is, this is not understood. 
that in Beijing, uh, there's a view that Korea is up, up for play, as it historically has been in Northeast Asia. And I also worry that in Tokyo, uh, there's a view growing that the U.S.-Korea alliance is not so strong and that Korea is in play. So the fact that we have a very strong uh, U.S.-Korea relationship um, uh, does not mean that Seoul or, or Washington can be complacent about how Korea's role in Asia looks to other parties. And um, I wonder whether the Park government has taken a little too much comfort in the strength of the U.S.-Korea alliance um, and, and, and not thought enough about how um, Korea's role in Asia is perceived um, by China, by Japan in particular, um, and that a, a stronger South Korean foreign policy in 2015 would think about that 360-degree um, view um, about how Korea is viewed. Because when Korea is viewed as being in play strategically in Asia, it never ends well for anyone. Great, Mike. Just to follow up on that terrific point, uh, when you say it never ends well, this idea of Korea being in play, what potential unintended or negative consequences could we see, whether in 2015, 2016, or down the road from this view, even if it is incorrect? Yes, me for the yeah. Black Swan. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, a nuclear test, <clears throat> if we went back to the Japan-Korea question, it would solve that uh, a little bit. Um, aside from a nuclear test, <clears throat> um, the, um, uh, there are two things. Uh, uh, one would be <clears throat> um, something, these are black swans. These are sort of out of the expectation. <clears throat> the um, the Tokto Takeshima ter uh, Island issue is unlike the Senkaku Diaoyu issue between Japan and China. It's not a militarized <clears throat> or uh, uh, a tense issue that could lead to accidental conflict. <clears throat> but um, I think that issue, because of uh, fishing fleets and other things, um, could, could, I wouldn't bet on this, but that could be something that suddenly um, creates uh, challenges in the Japan-Korea relationship as it did in 94, I think. Um, and uh, not something th people think about, but fishing fleets um, are a wild card in all of these relationships. Great, let's go back to Victor. Yeah. I mean, the... the, the um... I think the, the thing that is did yet. And you know, to the extent there are these black swans that come down the stream uh, later on in 2015 or further, those will really <clears throat> test the relationship, and then we'll really sort of see where you know where Korea falls, if you will. So um, uh, um, you know, one example clearly is some sort of North Korean provocation, and if, uh, the, as Chris says, if the Chinese don't um, do what everybody wants them to do and they kind of hang on um, to, their, to their little brother, then, um, you know, what, how are the Koreans going to respond to that? The other is, going back to a previous question, the likelihood of some sort of Sino-Japanese um, conflagration over either fishing boats or the, or, um, or the Senkaku Daitai or something like that, even though Korea won't be militarily involved in that, everybody's going to watch where Korea stands on that, right? And if they sort of take a, you know, completely sit back attitude, then all the theories about Korea being in play are going to really start, start to come up. So I think those sorts of things. Um, there have been a, uh, some small things, for example, missile defense, uh, you know, where the Chinese have come out very strongly to the South Koreans and said, do not have, allow the U.S. to have THAAD on the Korean Peninsula. If you do, that will put you in the adversary camp. And, um, and I don't really consider that a test because, uh, you know, anytime anybody tells a Korean, don't do this, they're going to do the opposite thing, right? So. <laughs> So the Korean response is, you know, you, you know, they've been quite negative to that sort of Chinese heavy-handedness. Um, but I think some of these other things, particularly something that happens between China and Japan over fishing boats or over the island um, and where Korea sits, not uh, militarily, but politically on the issue will, will, will uh, be an important test. No. Terrific. Let's pull Russia into our conversation this morning with our next clicker question. In 2015, China-Russia relations will A, align based on defense cooperation and coordination in regional institutions, B, strengthen significantly through defense and energy ties, 
C, weaken somewhat as Japan-Russia ties develop, or D, not matter much for regional security? It looks like our audience is voting pretty strongly in favor of B, with 53% thinking that China and Russia will strengthen significantly their ties through defense and energy mechanisms. But we've also got a, a significant showing in favor of A, defense cooperation and coordination through regional institutions. So let's go to Chris on this one. Chris, what's your take on China-Russia relations in 2015? How have they changed even just over the last couple of years? Well, I think... Uh, we're certainly seeing a situation in their bilateral relationship where, because of the difficulties with Ukraine and so on, the two of them uh, are coming closer. Uh, and there certainly does seem to be a fairly strong personal tie between Xi Jinping and Putin. They seem very comfortable with each other. Uh, in some ways, they see, I think, in the other themselves, uh, in that they are confident leaders, people who uh, feel they're very much in charge of their own system as uh, odd as that system may be, <laughs> and um, that they will defend that system, you know, that they've uh, created. And I think there's heavy alignment between the two of them on this notion that the West is out to destroy the, the systems that we have created, uh, whether it's color revolutions or other, um, other uh, issues. So I think what's striking about what's happened just in the last couple of years is the degree to which um, they have sort of gotten around some of the longstanding tensions in the relationship. They're still there, and you know, most folks who've watched the relationship for a long time argue those impose serious constraints on their ability to work together. I happen to agree with that viewpoint, uh, but my own view is that it also doesn't mean that they can't make a mess uh, together if they want to on, on the way down. And I also do feel that this uh, ideological piece is very new uh, in some ways and, uh, and different, certainly very different than what brought them together in the, in the 50s. So, uh, and I think we see them also both at very high leadership labels in their interactions, saying things they haven't before with regard to the fact that the rebalance to Asia is aimed at them. You know, I mean, you, we saw this when the Russian defense minister visited China. Uh, so my sense is that it's not just about uh, strengthening through defense and energy ties. Those are going to be the main uh, methods, but I think it's these other things as well. How are they going to talk together about the new security concept in Asia? You know, what, what kind of discussion will they have about that? Central Asia is very interesting. Uh, you know, it's my impression that up until now, they've kind of decided just not to talk about it because clearly what China is doing in Central Asia would pose some sort of a challenge to Russia's traditional sphere of influence there. Uh, and so I think we have to wait and see. What was striking to me was when the ruble had its uh, near collapse. Uh, you know, my sense historically of Chinese behavior would have been for them to just back off and say, whoa, that looks really bad, let's get away from it. Uh, in, instead, Premier Li Keqiang, you know, uh, made a statement the next day saying that they would come in. They didn't come in with much money, but it's unusual Chinese behavior in that regard. Um, so I think that tells us something. And then just in closing, for the first time since the end of the Cold War, I think we do have a Russia-U.S.-China triangular relationship again, uh, and that means we have to pay attention to it. Uh, it's not an isosceles triangle and, and, and so on, but it is a triangle that requires management, skillful management by the U.S., and an understanding that something is indeed going on in that relationship that's new. Bonnie, let's get your thoughts on this trajectory. On this issue of a, the reemergence of a triangular relationship among the three, which is where I started in the early 80s watching uh, chi this strategic triangle, I think the Chinese feel rather uncomfortable in some ways. Uh, uh, yes, it could be a source of leverage. Uh, they uh, are working with the Russians, as you say, on criticizing the United States, its alliances. Uh, they, are, uh, they are promoting uh, cooperation and uh, promoting regional security mechanism that might exclude the United States. But at the same time, I think the Russian invasion of Ukraine is very unsettling to the Chinese, uh, particularly a hold the holding of a referendum, which uh, always in Chinese minds they think of Taiwan, and uh, that could be a real threat for them, I think, in their, in their view. Uh, so I, I, I think that the Chinese really don't want to uh, have tension in their relations with the United States. And as the U.S.-Russia relationship continues to be tense, that p creates challenges for China to really hold together its uh, new type of major uh, power relationship uh, with, uh, with the United States. So I think that uh, it, China is 
uh, just a little uneasy about that. I think we're going to see more cooperation on cyber security, internet uh, regulations. Uh, the Chinese and Russians have been working together uh, on that. And then I think a big question mark is in the uh, energy field. Uh, if the Europeans are going to hold on the sanctions and the Russians then have to sell more uh, oil and gas to China, that the Chinese are going to be the beneficiaries of that. They've taken advantage of it, and they will continue. But you may have heard in the news today that uh, you know Greece is somewhat um, uncertain whether it is going to uphold uh, the uh, the EU sanctions, and so you know there'll there'll be some issues going forward. But uh, this provides, I think, some uh, potential benefits for China that the Chinese will reap, uh, reap these benefits. Uh, the last thing that I would say is uh, the economic relationship between China and Russia is growing, uh, I think close to now uh, 100 billion. But let's remember, that's less than one-fifth of the trade relationship between the United States and China. So once again, uh, the United States looms very large in China's foreign policies and priorities. And although China talks about its and talks up its strategic relationship with Russia, um, I think it pales in, comportant, in importance to that of the United States. And so what you see is Chinese-Russian cooperation on a select set uh, of issues. Um, and those are important, and we need to watch them. But I would argue that it's not the strategic relationship uh, that the two actually use in their moniker uh, for it. Terrific. So just to follow up uh, with both Bonnie and Chris, if uh, this was truly a strengthening partnership at its core, what signs would we look for as a strengthening partnership as opposed to sort of an opportunistic marriage of convenience? We've noted a, a number of ways in which uh, Ch China and Russia have cooperated in the last year or so, a number of ways in which they might in this coming year. Uh, what, what should we be looking for to know whether this is becoming a, a more strategic, deep partnership? And what would tell us that this is really more opportunistic? Uh, well, we could look for uh, certainly more cooperation in the military sphere. We already see a significant amount, uh, joint exercises. Uh, the cooperation is being reinvigorated in uh, the co-op in uh, military production. Uh, so we could look for some really significant systems and, and a, a dramatic expansion of their uh, of their cooperation. But I would, what I would really look for would be a real alignment that would be anti-US. I, I really don't think we're going to see that. I think that's extremely unlikely. Uh, but if the Chinese were to conclude that the US threat to China in the rebalance to Asia and how it is conducted is so threatening uh, that China has to reorder its priorities, put this relationship with uh, Russia at the top, treat it as a real uh, alliance, then I think that that is, is really what would tell the rest of us that this is a, uh, a fundamentally different relationship than it has been in the past. Chris, any additional thoughts on that? I would just, I, I think Bonnie's absolutely right. I mean, that would be the smack everyone in the face, <laughs> uh, determinant that it had indeed shifted. I, I think smaller things to look for uh, might be uh, military technological cooperation below the level of Finnish systems uh, and, and emphasizing Russian expertise in very fine technolo uh, technology elements. The other piece would be some greater sign of Russian willingness to respond to what I presume is pretty steady Chinese pressure not to sell gear to Vietnam um, not to sell gear to other places. I don't think the Russians will do it because they need to sell this stuff. Um, but that would certainly be another indicator that it, they're drawing closer. Well, let's keep our eye on China, but travel to Southeast Asia for our next audience question. In 2015, China-ASEAN relations will be characterized primarily by which of the following? A, increased coercion by China. B, increased coercion by ASEAN countries. C, legal proceedings by either or both sides. D, intervention by third parties, such as the United States and Japan. Or E, reduce tensions and progress on a code of conduct for the South China Sea. It looks like our audience is voting overwhelmingly in favor of 
increased coercion by China. Perhaps our audience has been coerced. Um, but, but there is some hope here for reduced tensions and progress on a code of conduct in the South China Sea as well. Um, actually, a reasonable optimism in that regard. Bonnie, uh, let's get your views on this first. What are the prospects for China-ASEAN China relations in 2015? What are the prospects for a code of conduct? How much does it matter that Malaysia has taken over chairmanship of ASEAN? Well, I think part of this question is asking whether Chinese foreign policy, uh, the way that it approaches the South China Sea, um, has actually shifted in the aftermath of the Foreign Affairs Work Conference uh, that was held last November. Um, and I think that the jury is still out. Uh, we could see some tactical uh, shifts uh, and uh, less Chinese pressure uh, on other claimants in the South China Sea particularly Vietnam, because I think that the Chinese were taken by surprise by the vehement reaction of uh, the Vietnamese when they deployed the oil rig off the coast of the Paracels and in Vietnam's EEZ. And so I think that the Chinese are going to be uh, a little bit more sensitive uh, to Vietnam uh, and its concerns because of the potential impact on the domestic situation in v Vietnam, where I think Beijing fears that its behavior has begun to push Vietnam uh, to get much closer to the United States, something uh, particularly in security uh, sphere that, uh, uh, that uh, China does not want to see. Uh, so then the question is, uh, what kind of coercion uh, could we see? And we could see economic coercion against the Philippines, uh, which we have seen in the past in the form of uh, quarantine of uh, bananas uh, or preventing Chinese tourists from uh, going to the Philippines. We've actually seen some pressure to not send tourists to Vietnam as well recently. Uh, so we could certainly see some more economic coercion and then we could see uh, military uh, coercion. It, in the form of uh, the second Thomas Scholl situation where we have this rusted out World War II vintage uh, naval ship that was uh, beached on second Thomas Scholl in 1999 uh, and it, if, is, if it is not reinforced uh, with uh, concrete or something else is good chance that in 2015 that will slide into, uh, into the water Chinese law enforcement ships are operating very, very closely uh, around that shoal and would probably move in uh, and uh, take over uh, that, uh, that land feature, which is, by the way, uh, completely submerged. Uh, so that's something else uh, that could happen in 2015. Uh, I'm, it's interesting to me that we've got 25% who are hopeful about uh, progress on the code of conduct. Uh, I myself am not very optimistic uh, about the code of conduct. Uh, I think that the Chinese are uh, continuing to hold out the prospect of a code of conduct, but at least until this case, which of course is raised in uh, the sea in legal proceedings, uh, which the Philippines uh, has this case that the arbitral tribunal could come to a decision late this year, it may go to early next year, uh, hard to say, it's assuming that they find a jurisdiction. But as long as that case is pending, I'm fairly doubtful that the Chinese are going to move forward uh, on a code of conduct, but they will keep talking about it. Chris, your thoughts on this question? I, I just was intrigued by the coercive arm of ASEAN. <laughs> I, wasn't, I wasn't aware of that. <laughs> so I have to do, got to do some research apparently. Um, no, I mean, my thinking is very similar to Bonnie's. I, I think uh, certainly the messaging coming out of the Foreign Affairs Work Conference, just like the Peripheral Diplomacy Conference the year prior, uh, was that we've got some work to do on the, on the periphery, uh, which of course implies some acknowledgement that what they have been doing isn't being very successful. Um, some effort, I think, to reset toward uh, a friendlier policy, uh, toward what worked in the past with regard to good neighborliness with some new spin put on it uh, in Xi Jinping's speech with regard to developing a dedicated effort to develop soft power, you know, these sort of tools. I guess the question is, to what degree are the ASEAN countries buying it? Uh, you know, there, my sense is that when China uh, delimited the nine dash or brought out the nine dash line in 2009, it caught a lot of the ASEAN countries by surprise. Um, they 
reevaluated their assessment, perhaps, of, of where the Chinars are and what they're thinking. And so now when China returns to this more friendly approach, I think there's greater skepticism. One other thing I think that'll be very interesting, which I think does have a bearing on what happens down there this year, is to what degree, uh, if there are, increased cross-strait tensions uh, as the Taiwan president election comes closer and it looks like the opposition party in Taiwan might do better. Um, you know, last time that cycle happened in the mid-90s, the Chinese made a decided decision to, to focus exclusively almost on, on the cross-strait situation and let everything in the South China Sea go to the back burner. Um, it'd be interesting to see now with their perception of their growing influence and strength and, frankly, suite of capabilities, certainly, if they might try to manage both of those situations at the same time, so not letting up pressure down in the South China Sea, even if they did have to put more focus on cross strait. Chris, that's a great point and something we should all be keeping our eye on. Given that the Taiwan presidential elections are in 2016, do you anticipate that may become an issue as soon as this year, that Beijing will have to start juggling, or do we expect to wait a year or so until that becomes a true management problem again, if at all? Well, uh, you know, there, I think there does come a decided point as we go along the pathway and as they begin to see how the different candidates might be lining up uh, in, in Taiwan and so on, where they begin to feel that with uh, President Ma's approval rating continuing to struggle, uh, that they might feel a need to try to get something concrete out of him on the uh, on the issue core issue of sovereignty before he leaves office because they don't know what's going to come next. Uh, my sense is President Ma has been very clear that that's not on his agenda, <laughs> and so that in and of itself might uh, spark some difficulties. Uh, I certainly think that uh, we wouldn't have to wait until we were three weeks before the election to see some challenges. What what they won't do is what they've learned from the past, which is not to do public finger pointing and so on, uh, or, or you know, insist that the election go one way or the other. Um, but if we do have greater tension there, I mean, you know, my own sense is that the most realistic uh, piece or, or instance of Xi Jinping's kind of true views on this issue were when he had his first meeting with uh, Lian Zhan, where he said, you know, the issue can't go on from generation to generation. He hasn't said that since, but I think it was very telling that he did at the beginning. Terrific, thank you. Let's stick uh, in maritime security issues and China for one more audience question. Do you expect that China will deploy its 981 oil rig in disputed waters, declare an ADIZ, or take some other destabilizing action in the South China Sea in 2015? A, yes, or B, no. Once again, for those of you who like C, this is not an opportunity to press C. It's a yes or no question. Will China take some destabilizing action in the South China Sea this year? Once again, C and E, audience favorites. Somebody, somebody is sitting on their clicker. <laughs> Our audience is voting strongly in favor of, yes, China will take some other destabilizing action, some destabilizing action, rather, in the South China Sea in 2015. Bonnie, let's get your thoughts on this question, not only how likely some destabilizing action is, uh, but what particular destabil destabilizing action we might see, what factors might lead China, for example, to declare an ADIZ in the South China Sea, if that's likely at all this year. Well, I've already talked about this to some extent, Miro, but let me just add a few points. Uh, obviously, one of the issues uh, in advance of potentially declaring an aid is, is whether China has the capabilities to enforce it. So uh, that is one of the reasons why I think there is so much attention being paid uh, to the land reclamation activities taking place uh, in the South China Sea, where we are seeing now the Chinese have one airstrip in uh, the Paracels and now one likely in the Spratleys. And it may be more than one since there's re land reclamation going on at about five or six uh, land features uh, in the Spratleys now. Uh, the Chinese Defense Ministry continues to state that the security situation is not uh, very worrisome in the South China Sea and therefore at the present time they are not uh, seeking to declare an ADIS. So if the Chinese change their assessment of the security situation, or maybe when they have the capabilities, they will conveniently change their assessment of the security situation um, and uh, declare one. Uh, I have heard very explicitly from uh, particularly senior PLA officials uh, that this is something that is in fact on the agenda. Uh, the, the 
Air Force, of course, is wanted in ADIS over East China Sea, South China Sea, and uh, Yellow Sea, that this is in the plan. I believe it's a question of when, not a question of if. So yes, this is something that could occur in uh, 2015. And then finally, I don't think that we're going to see this rig deployed in uh, Vietnam's waters. Uh, in the near future, for reasons that I talked about earlier. I think the Chinese are quite concerned about uh, the domestic political balance uh, within Vietnam that they don't really want to push uh, over, over the edge. Chris, let's get your take on this question. What sorts of calculations are China's leaders making with respect to things like potentially declaring a South China Sea aid is, and is that likely to come to fruition this year? I, mean, I largely agree with Bonnie. I think it is on the agenda. Timing is the issue, uh, not whether or not they will or will not do it. Uh, my personal view is they probably won't do it this year. Uh, that's all I have on that one. Thank you. Let's now broaden our aperture a bit as we move on to our 10th question. Uh, when President Obama was in India just last week and, and made a joint statement uh, with Modi, uh, one of their many agenda items was the fact that they expected to broaden trilateral cooperation with Japan. Uh, so we have a question now for our audience about how Japan-India relations will fare in 2015. Will they A, improve mainly based on economic cooperation? B, improve mainly based on security cooperation. C, improve based on strengthened economic and security ties. D, sustain positive momentum but not achieve concrete results. Or E, deteriorate. Our audience seems to think they are likely to improve based on both strengthened economic and security ties. Um, but this, of course, strengthening relationship between Japan and India may be a sign of a broader trend that we'd like to parse here uh, as we get close to wrapping up our panel today. And that is the fact that we are seeing some new alignments uh, that may not have been particularly present in the region before, but are sort of coming to the fore now. This, of course, includes Japan and India, but also includes new relationships like Japan and Australia. So let's turn to Mike Green and get his thoughts on uh, this emerging trend and this particular bilateral relationship. Well, I'm, I'm guessing everybody who answered D has actually done business in India. Um, <laughs> but, but, I would still, but I would still say, um, let me recover. <laughs> I would still say that C is right. I'd put about 90% on C. Uh, um, for one thing, the J uh, Japan-India relationship has been underinvested for decades. You know, um, ideationally, um, India has no history problem with Japan. Um, the Indian judge at the Tokyo War Crimes Tribunal refused to find Japan guilty. Um, so there's no, there's, if anything, ideational or, or, or identity uh, bonds. Um, India needs infrastructure investment technology. Japan's got it and needs markets, and then they both our maritime powers with, with strong navies um, dealing with a rising China. So there are a lot of reasons why this relationship for both countries is going to catch up. So we're not talking about, um, we're really talking about catching up from decades of um, sort of odd estrangement, what my friend Satu Lame calls the result of having, you know, sushi and samosa at the same <coughs> deal. Um, uh, not, a, not an easy mix, but for Abe and for Modi, and Rick Rosso may talk about this in the next panel, um, it's all win-win. And um, the two governments have set up a two plus two arrangement for defense and um, foreign ministry senior officials, uh, ministers. Um, they're going to now regularize not only bilateral uh, defense engagement, but also uh, trilateral in the uh, um, exercises with the U.S. Um, and I would actually even go a little further out on the limb and say in 2015, you'll start seeing Japanese defense items. Uh, being discussed um, and uh, perhaps even agreed on for sale to India because of the changes in Japan's um, arms export uh, rules. <clears throat> so I think there's a lot of room for, for, uh, for growth. It, 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 there's going to be a capacity problem. The Indian foreign ministry is about the size of New Zealand's. Um, excellent like New Zealand's, of course. But, um, <clears throat> but uh, um, uh, so there will be capacity issues. But I think both Prime Ministers see this as win-win. As and it, it points to another, we need to end and get to the Q&A, but another thing we should put on the table before finishing, which is uh, this other sign of alignments, not alliances, don't want to overstate it, but alignments uh, as Japan reaches out much more uh, ambitiously, not only with India, but with Australia, uh, and with ASEAN, with Canada, with Israel, 
you probably saw Prime Minister Abe agreed with Prime Minister Netanyahu on, on defense equipment development. <coughs> um, Australia and Japan, as many of you know, are developing a replacement for the Australian Collins class submarine. Uh, I was in, I was talking to both governments at fairly senior levels recently. They're, they're very confident this is going to move forward with U.S. help. <coughs> um, and, uh, and with Vietnam and the Philippines, Japan is uh, promoting um, the export of non-lethal uh, equipment like patrol boats and things to help with maritime domain awareness. This is not an alliance with a mutual security uh, commitment where you're going to suddenly see um, you know, the Vietnamese Navy show up in the East China Sea to help Japan. It's not that kind of um, uh, Article 5 security treaty real alliance, but it's, 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 it's quite significant. Um, and the fact that some of these ASEAN states are willing to be public about it, in spite of China's presence, is, is significant. And on the 70th anniversary, um, Japan doesn't have a real problem in Southeast Asia or South Asia. 96% um, of ASEANs in polls last year, uh, the 10 ASEAN countries, citizens said they like Japan and relations are good. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, um, it's, it's not only productive, I think for Prime Minister Abe, it's fun. It's not like dealing with China and Korea. <clears throat> that said, strategically for Japan, uh, the Northeast Asia piece is always going to be more important. And these help Japan's strategy, but that doesn't um, obviate the need for thinking about relations in the um, toughest part of the neighborhood for Japan, which is Northeast Asia. But there's a lot more of this going on. Um, you know, and I, w I don't think it, it is the, we're not looking at blocks. This is not a sort of Russian Chinese axis against a maritime democratic axis with Korea stuck in the middle. Um, I don't think it's that pronounced. I think every country is deepening cooperation, signing trade deals, um, uh, and hedging at the same time, and the hedging behavior is more pronounced. Um, but in, in, in large measure, that's because most of these countries that we're talking about now, India, ASEAN, and so forth, want to see a trans-Pacific, open, rules-based, democratic order, want China integrated in a way where it can't use coercive means to change the rules. So I think it will, it will only accelerate. Terrific. Well, audience, uh, now is the opportunity for you to chime in if you felt insufficiently enfranchised by your use of the clickers for this last hour. Uh, we are going to take some questions from our audience. Please raise your hand if you have a question, and if you're called on, please do remember to state your name and affiliation and be brief. Questions? Looks like we have one right here. Could we get a microphone? Hi, I'm um, Dr. Donna Wells. I work for the clandestine service of the Central Intelligence Agency. I'm also a NASA engineer. Uh, I went to Georgia Tech and the University of Texas. Um, I've submitted this proof to the network. Can you comment on it? It's a math proof uh, pertaining to the trillion dollars uh, we owe China, specifically the People's Republic of China. So it's, um, it's an if-then statement. It's symbolic logic. Uh, we study symbolic logic at the University of Texas. It is in the philosophical department. So it's, if a debt, and this is also basic contract law, um, if a debt cannot be collected and it can also cannot be itemized, this is two things. It can't be collected and it cannot be itemized. It is therefore null and void. Null is the Russian word for zero. Can you please comment on it? Thank you. Uh, Chris, do you have any comments on that? <laughs> Not sure I understand the question, but uh, uh, I, I think it's basically, uh, are we in deep trouble because of the amount of money we owe the Chinese? Uh, I, I always come back to the fundamental principle, which is that uh, any Chinese action against the U.S. currency is uh, ultimately going to redouble back upon themselves. So um, I guess you just wanted to have that read into the record. I'm, I'm not sure. So. Okay. Do we have any other questions from our audience here today? Yes, gentlemen, right here with glasses on. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Won Ho Kim, professor of Hangul University of Foreign Studies, Korea, and Johns Hopkins uh, Science. My question will be addressed to Dr. Cha or any other others who wish to kindly answer. First question is about Korea-Japan relations. Um, the bilateral relations has been quite cold for the past, only the last than 10 years. Uh, though, that bilateral relations has been inelastic to any changes domestically and internationally. Uh, several or two or three government changes in South Korea 
and as many number or more number of government changes in Japan, and North Korean regime cha uh, leadership change and Chinese leadership change and uh, global recession, and all those kind of factors did not affect positively bilateral relations between South Korea and Japan. Then, what factors, what environment would lead to the improvement of the bilateral relations? Second question, very briefly. Uh, Inter-Korean relations. Uh, this question will be addressed to Dr. Chang. Park Geun-hye government is the first Korean government which outspokenly claim reunification. Then, how much how much, um, how would North Korea react to this outspoken approach by South Korean government to reunification? Thank you. Let's go first to Mike and then Victor on this first question about the persistently cold nature of ROK Japan relations, and then uh, we'll ask Victor Cha to comment on uh, Park Geun Hye's outspoken policies. Um, I teach a course at Georgetown this afternoon, in fact, on leaders in Asia. And the structural factors or the ideational factors always constrain leaders, but real leadership is about stretching those boundaries. So to me, the Japan-Korea um, uh, relationship will be turned around when there's um, a stronger leadership recognition than we have now that it's important for both countries' interests. Um, and that's what Kim Dae-jung and Obuchi did. Um, uh, it's harder now for a lot of reasons. Um, and as I said in the earlier uh, question, I'm not highly optimistic that um, this will happen this year. I think the countries, both countries will manage this. So it'll probably be a summit, not transformational, but you know, manage it and perhaps do a little better. But eventually it's going to take a, a leadership decision uh, that each side will take some political risk at home because it's for the larger national interest. Um, so first on, the, on Japan, Korea, I mean, I think I don't disagree with the characterization that over the past few years it's been quite bad. Um, at the same time, though, um, again, constant with the theme I was making earlier, I mean, the real analytic question is, what have we missed, right, uh, in this period when things have been bad, right? You know, because the way we measure um, the value of this relationship is, and the way history impedes it, is in terms of the acts of cooperation that did not happen, right, when they might have because of uh, a rational interest. And so, so the things that we haven't seen, we haven't seen a summit, right? Um, we haven't seen uh, a general information sharing agreement, right? Uh, there's a military parts servicing agreement that couldn't be done. Um, there's an FTA that hasn't been completed, but I wouldn't say that has anything to do with anything other than the difficulty of the two large economies trying to um, um, uh, negotiate an FTA. I don't think that has anything to do with the historical emotional issues. <clears throat> um, and then there was this one effort at a collective defense statement. Right? I mean, so these are the things that we've missed. Are they important? Of course they're important. Um, does that fundamentally make it difficult for Japan, Korea, the United States to transact their business, whether it's politics and security in the region? I would say no. Right? Um, now, there was a short period where you could argue it was dysfunctional, where there were no meetings taking place between the two sides. But quietly, these have come back on. Um, both at the bilateral level and the trilateral level. Uh, uh, Sung Kim, the Deputy uh, Assistant Secretary of State, was just in uh, Asia and did a trilateral uh, with, uh, with his Japanese and Korean counterparts. So it's starting to come back on. And then, even if it's not a leadership change issue, whenever there's something that happens um, that compels cooperation, we've seen it, both historically and today. I mean, the fact that they were able to finally conclude an information sharing agreement on North Korea shortly after this, this North Korean cyber hacking case, right, against Sony, again, to me is a sign that when things happen, 
there, there's an effort by responsible people to forge cooperation, even if the irresponsible politicians can't do it. Um, and, and so I think that's a, so that's why I, you know, I'm trying to, you know, every, whenever we talk about Japan Korea, it's like always so dark, but if we actually look at the longer perspective, it's, yes, it's complex, but it's not as bad as we think it is. In terms of unification, um, uh, uh, Pakane certainly talks a lot about unification. Her predecessor did as well. And I know one take on this is to say it's ideological, right? Because prior to Lee Myung-bak and Park Geun-hye, there wasn't as much open talk about unification for the previous decade because you had progressive governments in Korea, Kim Dae-jung, No Mi-hun, progressive governments. And where talking about unification was really not considered politically correct. Um, so one take is that you have two conservative leaders, that's why they talk about unification. And that may be true. But I think what really drives the discussion of unification in Korea today is a concern about what's happening in North Korea. I think there's a concern that um, there's little sign of economic reform under this new leadership. Uh, the, this young leader of North Korea doesn't seem to be interested in foreign direct investment law, in um, um, uh, um, free trade zones or special economic zones or any of these sorts of things. He's interested in ski resorts and amusement parks and Dennis Rodman and, you know, not serious things. And so I think for that reason, there's a growing concern that the future is not as stable as we might wish it to be. And I think that's why we're hearing more discussion of unification because they're trying, to prepare, they're trying to prepare the country, their people, the world, that this is something that could fall into their laps. Not that they're trying to push it, but it's something that could fall into their laps. So. Let's take one more question right here in the front. Thanks. Um, Lynn Kwok, Brookings Institution. Um, there have been calls within the US for uh, Taiwan, including from people like Bonnie Glazer, for uh, for um, Taiwan to take a step to clarify its position on the dashed line in the South China Sea. Um, could you speak to what the US would be willing to do to support such efforts um, on the Taiwanese end, especially since um, many Southeast Asian countries are not willing to openly at least um, support Taiwan because of China's um, position? Thank you. Well, I personally have called for Taiwan to clarify its position on what was the original 11 dash line uh, that uh, was, of course, uh, created under uh, the KMT uh, when it was in uh, power on the mainland. Uh, but frankly, I think this is something that all, uh, all of the claimants should do. Uh, they should make quite clear uh, what their claims are uh, and specifically bring their claims in uh, line with the UN Convention uh, on the Law of the Sea. So identify what land features they claim and then uh, what uh, territorial space, whether it's a 12-mile uh, uh, territorial waters or a 200-mile uh, uh, exclusive economic zone and continental shelf uh, that they might claim around land features. Uh, so I think that it, is, uh, it contributes to the uncertainty and the instability that prevails in the South China Sea that uh, most of the claimants have really not uh, made their claims uh, clear. Uh, so this is something I think we've seen a little bit of progress from uh, a few of the claimants and, uh, and Taiwan is, uh, is one of them. Uh, so uh, this is, uh, I don't think should be linked directly uh, to the issue of Taiwan's participation in, um, for example, talks on the code of conduct. I personally would like to see Taiwan uh, be at that table. It is a claimant. Uh, if we want to talk about uh, some of the activities that are taking place on some of the land features, uh, Taiwan obviously occupies uh, the largest, although I think as of a few weeks ago, it's the second largest because China is building fiery cross very, very quickly. Uh, but Taiping Island uh, is probably the largest natural uh, land feature. 
and uh, is, Taiwan is engaged in some activities in trying to uh, uh, expand the, uh, uh, the runway uh, and the ports. Uh, there are no troops deployed on, uh, on Taiping Island, but there's, uh, there's, there's coast guards. Uh, so I think that if uh, Taiwan uh, were at the table, I think it would play a constructive role. Uh, but having said that, I don't think that the two should be uh, linked. Uh, I think that Taiwan has an interest in demonstrating that it is a responsible player uh, and therefore uh, should clarify what its uh, claim is, bring it into line with the UN Convention, the law of the sea, uh, and uh, encourage all the other claimants to do that as well. Thank you for being such an active and engaged audience. We are going to take a short break and reconvene here at 1025 for our next panel on leadership and economic reform. But before we go, I hope you'll thank me in thanking, join me in thanking this terrific panel uh, for their thoughtful forecast and great discussion. Thanks so much.